What's up guys? So AMD recently launched their B450 platform with a whole lineup of B450 motherboards, one of which we'll be taking a look at today. This is the Asus ROG Strix B450i Gaming. It's a mini ITX board. It's actually the first and only B450 board I've received here in the studio, which is why we're taking a look at it. I didn't really have many other options at this point, but it's a cool little board. Oh, let me, hold on, plastic wrap. Plastic wrap alert, one sec. Oh, Ooh, and it broke in half, so you guys even get a, a double feature here. Oh. So it's always the little one. The little ones are always the best. The Corsair K70 RGB Mark II features a variety of genuine Cherry MX switches, vibrant customizable RGB backlighting, and a solid aluminum frame built to last. Enjoy features such as USB pass-through, multimedia controls, Windows lock key, and more. Available in black or white and silver, click the link below for more info. Now that I have your attention, B450 is to X470 as B350 was to X370. So this is basically a much cheaper alternative with a lot of the same features that you'll find on the higher end Ryzen supported motherboards. So uh, that's exciting. Now since the B450 platform is the focus for today's video, I wanted to quickly highlight some of the differences between this platform and X470 as well as B350, its predecessor, before we dive into the board itself. So for starters, uh, I would say X470 is really reserved for people who are users who are trying to hit the highest possible overclocks. They're generally a bit more over-engineered than B450 or B350. Um, so if you're trying to break some world records or you're just trying to milk every ounce of performance out of your CPU, then I would suggest going X470. If you're spending, you know, $300 plus on a CPU, you probably don't mind spending another $50 to $100 on a motherboard that has greater overclocking capabilities. Additionally, multi-GPU support is uh, available on X470, but that's not the case on B450. You only get one 1x16 support here, whereas uh, you get 1x16 and 2x8 support on X470. So if you drop a second card in there, it can split the PCIe lanes and you can take advantage of SLI or Crossfire. Considering that most users these days are just dropping a single graphics card into their systems and SLI and Crossfire aren't even really being advertised much by uh, the chip makers these days, um, this isn't a huge deal for, for most people. So it's really just for, if you're trying to go balls to the wall, you're, you're again trying to squeeze every last bit of performance out of your board, then you're probably gonna wanna avoid B450 and opt for the more expensive platform. X470 also has a smidge more IO connectivity than its B450 counterpart in the way of USB 3.1 Gen 1, and it has a few more pieces PCIe lanes, both uh, Gen 2 and Gen 3. Most users are going to be totally fine with the amount of I.O. that's supported on board, B, on board on B450. If you have uh, specific needs uh, as a user, then you might need that extra I.O then you're gonna to wanna to opt for X470. Now, moving on to the differences between B450 and B350. I mean, for starters, you get support for faster memory speeds uh, with these newer boards. And that's actually really important with Ryzen, of course, because of the Infinity fabric and uh, how dependent it is on memory frequency. So, uh, so that's a huge feature, uh, improved memory controller, faster memory speeds overall. The other main benefits of B450 over its predecessor are mostly software-based, uh, things like PBO or Precision Boost Overdrive and StoreMI. PBO is very similar to XFR and Precision Boost 2, but it essentially looks at the VRM usage on your motherboard, and if there's additional headroom there, uh, and provided that your cooling's in check, it'll just send more juice to your CPU and uh, basically boost up the frequencies on any num number of cores. It works very dynamically, so if you're using, a, if you're running a lightly threaded workload, it might only boost one or two cores, uh, and that way it'll actually be able to hit higher frequencies. Whereas if you have a heavily multi-threaded workload or you're gaming in a, in a title that utilizes a bunch of cores, then it'll scale all the cores up uh, as, as long as there's that VRM uh, headroom. So it's actually a pretty cool technology. It's been announced for a while now, but it hasn't been super active or usable. It probably will uh, relatively soon. It's a future feature or whatever. Uh, the other thing is StoreMI. StoreMI basically takes two drives, presumably one uh, hard drive with a large capacity and an SSD with a smaller capacity, pairs them together, it shows up as a single drive in your OS, and it basically uh, dynamically chooses which files get stored on which drives depending on how frequently you use those files. So it's it sounds a lot like SSD caching, but it's definitely not. The technology's uh, enterprise level and it's been around for a while now. It works uh, differently in that sense than, than SSD caching, but the end result is kind of the same. You get a snappier and zippier system, uh, faster operation, all that sort of thing. The other great thing about it is that uh, you, can, you can basically install it or set it up before or after OS installation. So, uh, 
uh, that's really nice for and flexible for, for users who have an existing system and don't want to deal with all the fuss of trying to transfer over their OS or, or doing a clean install or something like that. So now that we've briefly distinguished B450 from X470 and B350, let's take a closer look at the motherboard. Right off the bat, I gotta say, it's a pretty handsome looking board. Um, very typical of what you'd find with the ROG boards these days with those sort of uh, silverish, grayish, uh, charcoal looking aluminum heat sinks. We've got a fat one over the VRM and it looks like there's one over the where one of the M.2 slots is uh, We'll get to that in just a bit, but very color neutral. It does have some aura sync lighting I believe on the M.2 cover here. Um, so overall very attractive. Uh, so AM4 socket of course uh, fully backwards compatible, I should have mentioned that earlier, um, with first gen Ryzen CPUs. Even supports, you know, Precision Boost 2 and XFR2, assuming you drop like a second gen Ryzen CPU in here, so that's pretty cool. Flanking the AM4 socket, you get your obligatory pair of DDR4 DIMM slots. At the top of the board, you'll find two RGB headers. One's a four pin and one's a three pin, so you get your choice of non-addressable or addressable uh, support there for your LED strips and devices. There are one, two, three fan headers, four pin PWM fan headers that support, you know, AIOs and pumps and things like that. Uh, and if we're talking about the VRM, since we're here, um, it looks like you've got six phase power uh, for, your, for your VRM going to your CPU, and then one phase power for your SOC. So the Overall VRM going to your CPU is pretty solid. Six phases on a mini ITX board, I'm digging that. The one phase on the SOC is a little concerning. Uh, I guess what this tells us is that use caution if you're gonna drop a, R a Raven Ridge APU in here because the SOC on Ryzen powers the iGPU uh, or the Vega graphics that are a part of the Ryzen APU. So maybe you wouldn't get the best overclocking potential uh, if you were to drop an APU in here, but uh, if you're just dropping you know, a normal CPU in here, you should be good to go with some decent overclocking. Uh, additionally, we've got an arrangement of SATA ports. So we've got two SATA ports on the right side of the board, and then two more just above the right side of the PCI Express slot, which, I don't know, that seems like it might pose some cable routing issues if you are gonna use those ports. They're just in a really awkward spot, and they're a little bit more inland uh, on the PCB. Than, than, than usual. You've also got USB 3, which seems to be in a good spot on the, the bottom right corner of the board, along with USB 2, a single USB 2 header. At the very bottom, you've got your PCI Express Gen 3 by 16 slot, looking pretty with uh, some, some aluminum or metal reinforcement, I should say. Uh, and then there's this 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 thing, what looks to be an M.2 shield or, or heat sink, which I guess we should pop off really quick and take a closer look, because this is quite interesting. So definitely a heat sink for your M.2 drive. Um, NVMe supported PCI Express Gen 3 by 4 and all that. So there is a thermal pad included with a little sticker on there you remove before you apply it. Uh, and then we've also got uh, our slot here. So the slot is kind of raised up. And that's because underneath it is a heatsink uh, for the for what I believe is the chipset. So I think it's the chipset heatsink underneath there. So they've kind of stacked or layered uh, different componentry on top of each other to save space on this very space constricted board, which I think is smart. Uh, this has also got uh, audio built into this little area. So not only is it an M.2 board, um, but there's, uh, there's audio at, at the back as well and it's got LED enhancement or whatever, so it, it, it shines, you know, lights up red, blue, and green to let you know what inputs they are just because you're really fancy and stuff. You got 802.11 AC Wi-Fi alongside an Intel Gigabit NIC, two USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports type A, as well as four USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports also type A. And finally, there's an HDMI out with HDR support, so if you were to drop an APU in here and you had an HDR supported monitor, first of all, lucky you, you'd be able to take advantage of that that high dynamic range capability, so that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing that I want to show you is the back of the board. Got a little back plate here, but there's another M.2 slot. Look at that, just right there on, on the back. It, this one's just kind of flat with the PCB, but uh, this board allows you to actually raid NVMe drives, uh, NVMe M.2 drives together, which is really sweet. Um, of course, this is going to be limited to a very small number of users, I would imagine, but it's kind of cool that you can do that on a mini ITX board. So there's a quick gander at the board. At this point, I'd like to actually get it booted with our Ryzen 5 2600X and try my hand at some overclocking just to see what the experience and, uh, and various behaviors are, um, and then we'll circle back and talk about it. So we'll be right back. All right, so I just spent the last hour or two setting up our test bed, uh, quite haphazardly, I might add. 
Um, but it's functional and the results are pretty good. You guys are gonna enjoy it. But before we get into that, let me quickly go over the hardware that I used here. Um, I didn't want cooling to be a limiting factor on our Ryzen 5 2600X, which is again, six cores, 12 threads. Um, so we have a Cooler Master Master Liquid NL240 RGB. As you can see, I did not use any of the RGB because it's pointless. Um, and then we also have a pretty fast memory kit from G-Scale. This is their Sniper X uh, DDR4 at 3400 speed, which we were able to hit no problem. And then we also have a Fractal Design Integra 550-650 watt power supply and a GTX 1050 Ti from MSI. This is simply so we can have a video output and see what we're doing. So um, all together, we were able to achieve a 4.2 gigahertz overclock on all cores, and that was at 1.375 volts within the UEFI. That was the first and last voltage value that I, that I attempted. It just worked. Um, I haven't, I don't have that much experience overclocking the 2600X specifically, um, but uh, the temperatures are even fine in case you're curious, it just hit 69, woohoo! But it's mostly been within the 60s and 70s. We're running rock solid stable right now, approaching half an hour in ADA 64. Uh, or IDA64, uh, I would suggest that if you're overclocking and you're gonna run that overclock regularly, perhaps on a daily basis, that you uh, definitely spend more than half an hour stress testing your CPU to ensure that your, your overclock's rock solid stable. But for the purpose of this video and in the interest of time, things are looking really, really good. It's really nice that we were able to hit 4.2 gigahertz because I've seen most users kind of max out at that frequency when overclocking their 2600Xs. So it's nice to know that we can actually hit that on a B450 motherboard, uh, Mini ITX nonetheless. Uh, additionally, I would say that this is probably, this board is probably the better value over the X470 equivalent because they seem pretty much exactly the same except for the chipset. Uh, so unless you really need that extra IO with, you know, USB 3.1, Gen 1 and 2, and maybe a couple extra PCIe lanes, which I don't think you would in most cases, um, you can't really utilize multi-GPU configurations at all on mini ITX anyway. So uh, X470 doesn't seem to make as much sense in this case. But those are my findings on the Asus as no the Asus Asrock the uh, the, uh, the Asus ROG Strix B450 i Gaming guys. Let me know what you think about this board, uh, what you think about the B450 platform as a whole, and feel free to toss a like on this video if you enjoyed it. You can also get subscribed for more tech videos coming at you really soon, and you can check me out on Floatplane if you want to watch my videos a week early without ads for three bucks a month. I'll put a link for that in the video description. As always, guys, thank you for tuning in. Have a good one and I'll see y'all in the next video.